Chapter 3, Scientific Reasons Why We Should Reject Residual Energy. And before we jump in, I want to emphasize that my argument is cum cumulative in nature. Um, there's about a dozen. There's numerous red flags, which if you take them together, I think dismantle the notion of residual energy. So I ask you please to keep the totality of my arguments or reasons in mind and not the, not miss the forest for the trees by getting too bogged down in just you know one particular argument that um, you are drawn to. And let it also be noted at the outset that my focus in this segment is on dismantling the residual theory and not an in-depth analysis of demonology. Along the way, I will be making references to explaining the truth behind residual haunts, but it's not my primary burden in this segment, which is showing how unnatural this alleged natural theory is. In any case, the truth is quite simple, as it should be, which brings us to our first point, which is Occam's razor, which has everything to do with simplicity. The scientific logical principle of Occam's razor has been a useful tool for centuries as a guiding principle for determining whether or not a theory is, um, is true or not. So, for example, if you have two or more competing theories, um, both of which can explain the phenomena, the idea behind Occam's razor is that the, uh, the principle of parsimony or parsimony um, is what it is a determining factor. That is, which one is the most simple. In other words, whichever theory that explains the phenomena most simply is to be preferred. Okay, Aristotle is thought to be the first to express this principle, but as with logic, he didn't create either principle. Rather, he discovered what is woven into the fabric of God's world. Shaving away with a razor all but the barest essentials to adequately explain the data is what we're after. There's two issues involved in Occam's razor. First is adequately explaining the phenomena, and then two, a concern for simplicity. For example, if... Um, two theories adequately explain the phenomena, or equally explain the, phenomena, the data, but one is much simpler. The simpler one with less variables is most likely the correct one. And it's, like I said, a time-honored principle that's assisted in many, many discoveries. And if you take the classic example of Copernicus versus Ptolemy, it's, it's a great uh, illustration of it. See, both theories, Copernicus and Ptolemy, could explain the phenomena of the solar system, but the Ptolemaic system had to continually add ad hoc hypothesis to account for newer observations and discoveries. The Earth-centered galaxy could only explain the phenomena by introducing complex epicycles, which added unwieldy and unnecessary complexity. And from a modern vantage point, it is an ugly theory, considered from an aesthetic perspective, which physicists often appeal to, beauty in an equation. Nature reveals the wisdom and beauty of God as seen in its unity and diversity in design, and design, exp as expressed in Romans 1, 19-20. So, some things about God's character are so clearly, clearly revealed in nature that it leaves us without excuse, and Occam's razor simply expresses this. So Copernicus' theory prevailed primarily because it clearly and simply explained all the phenomena. Conversely, the more variables that are introduced to explain natural process, processes, then the more likely it is mistaken. You see, God's world is wonderfully mysterious, but there is an underlying beauty of simplicity which makes exploration and discovery possible. When you have a proposed theory that contains a bunch of variables which are themselves mysterious, unexplainable, and untestable, unverifiable, and unfalsifiable, then that's a real problem. 
according to Occam's razor. So, um, when we apply Occam's razor to our discussion, we have two proposed solutions for explaining paranormal looking activity. You see, whatever else we say about either theory, we are talking about phenomena which looks, sounds, and smells just like supernatural activity, but is alleged to be non-intelligent. However, the competing theory, mine, assumes that the same phenomenon is actually quite intelligent. So, if you look at the differences, the paranormal community asserts that the following variables are included to explain the process. You have a trauma. This trauma emits psychic emotional energy shockwaves. Sometimes this emotional adheres to a rocky surface with the special photographic qualities. It remains clustered instead of diffusing. This rock takes a picture or a movie of the traumatic event. Upon a cue, this energy re reanimates. This energy rock combination also contains extraordinary projection capabilities and it projects it into the surroundings in a looping of the past, which may include sounds, smells, and even solid apparitions. Upon completion, it then re reclusters and waits for the next loop, and this looping may continue perpetually. Okay, I trust I haven't set up a straw man, but have accurately expressed the basics of the residual energy haunt theory. And now, and this is vital, all of these steps or variables are necessary to explain the phenomena in this theory. And I counted about six or seven. And how many are explainable in current scientific language? None. The demonic theory asserts one step or one variable, and that's demonic mimicry, to explain the same phenomena. Its assumption differs widely from the first in that we assume the activity is intelligent. Whatever sounds, smells, or apparitions which normally would be normally would be classified as paranormal but are not due to the subjective process of observing alleged non-intelligence are explained as being intelligent. The reason why the phenomena looks paranormal or supernatural is because it is supernatural and not because it is some unprecedented, complex, multi-stage process of nature. The appearance of non-intelligence is either due to misperception or demonic deception or both. So I could go in more about uh, that, but let me just say that um, the competing theory, mine, the demonic theory, is only simplistic if you assume your conclusion, which is circular reasoning. Uh, if you're a Christian, then you should never underestimate the creative power of the evil one to deceive by means of mimicry of even non-intelligence. And the theory I am proposing has one step and is entirely explainable, as opposed to the six steps, none of which are explainable. You know, it really is a paranormal, parapsychological community that has painted itself into a corner by asserting that residual energy haunts is caused by entirely natural processes. Introducing the supernatural is not unwarranted, unwarranted complexity because the biblical worldview is thoroughly supernatural and it is manifestly not natural processes at work. And this phenomenon is by no means analogous to something like Copernicus or gravity because it has all the hallmarks of paranormal supernatural activity, but people perceive that it is non-intelligent. Either way, unseen forces of some kind are causing screams, footsteps, smells, and solid apparitions, or any apparitions of any kind. So, by the end we shall see this demonic theory is most certainly in line with Occam's razor. So there's no precedent for this kind of supernatural looking activity as being nat natural. Nature looks like nature, and if it looks like a paranormal duck and walks like a paranormal duck, then it's probably a paranormal duck. Calling obviously supernatural activity natural processes is unreasonable and unnatural. Second point, there is no evidence for residual energy in haunts. None. 
Since it's supposedly natural forces at work, then one would assume that it would be subject to the normal processes of the scientific method, but it's resistant at every turn. Every aspect, every variable in the process is itself inexplicable. The only evidences I have seen are the positing, positing of either abstruse scientific theories or experience interpreted in a circular fashion. And actually, honest defenders of the theory acknowledge that the entire process from beginning to end remains a total mystery. Now, listen, please. You know, giving an analogy like a tape recorder is not evidence. And yet, when many people hear that tape analogy, they're convinced by it. But, my friends, an analogy is, is repeated so often that folks think they're hearing evidence, but it's not. It's an analogy, and it's not, as we're going to see, actually a very good one. And before you cry foul, think of how it's usually defended. Someone will state that they are going to show evidence for residual energy, and they point to a building which is allegedly filled with residual energy because of the trauma that occurred there, and then they mention the activity, and that's it. Or they will show footage of activity or EVPs of voices, and then declare that they are evidence of residual haunts because they are nonsensical answers. But again, that's not evidence because an, ex an experience interpreted circularly. It's arguing in a circular fashion, which is a logical fallacy. The data is interpreted in line with their assumptions regarding residual energy, but could easily be explained in a different fashion. So, um, a theory which lacks any hard evidence is itself evidence that it's false because it's neither verifiable nor falsifiable. But it seems to me that we treat this theory with kid gloves because I know of no other theory accepted by so many people that is entirely lacking in any hard evidence. Not a good start, says Dr. Ockham. Third argument. Let me begin by quoting a Miss Sherry Jones. I think she's a reverend. In an article that I read on Jeff Ballinger's um, Ghost Village newsletter, you know, the best selling author and advisor to the Ghost Adventures, quote, No universal way seems to exist to be able to shut down or stop a paranormal haunt reflection because we simply do not know what causes it to happen. Some people claim residual haunts happen due to, to a traumatic event, leaving an energy imprint. That may be true in a few cases, but in many scenes of PTR, uh, residual energy, paranormal time reflections, are commonplace occurrences like someone repeatedly walking from room to room, exiting through an apparent doorway that is no longer there, or doing some mundane task. Nothing seems to indicate why that particular moment in time gets captured and repeated, re repeatedly reflected back during our time, or perhaps through time perpetually. So, we are left also with the disconcerting truth that perhaps the majority of residual haunts are not caused by the alleged primary cause of residual haunts, a traumatic event, which leaves imprints on the surroundings. Rather confusing, to say the least. And no no means of cleansing it either. Um, in addition to this article, she belabors the point that we probably should not even call it a haunt in order not to frighten the homeowner who is in no danger whatsoever because of its alleged non-intelligent nature. Now Jones strikes me as an intelligent woman and she makes several significant points which amount to more than just mere anomalies uh, for the current residual energy haunt theory. It's actually evidence, I think, against it. Um, first, she asserts that the entire process from beginning to end is an enigma. We don't know what causes it to happen, not even a clue. It is significant that a notion accepted by so many is basically an entire mystery. She alludes to our third argument below regarding how the theory has no mechanism, so I'll skip over that. Have you ever tried to visualize your mind how this process occurs, I have, and I, I just can't do it in my brain, how, you know, the emitting of, of psychic energy sticks to rocks and then could cause this projection of solid apparition, 
do it. But, you know, the, a mystery cloud hangs over the entire process should be a cause for concern, but it does not seem to phase anyone. As long as they have their tape film analogy, then that seems to be sufficient. That all the variables are inexplicable is unheard of and is devastating. In light of Occam's razor, this theory is in, theory is in serious trouble. With the principle of parsimony or um, simplicity, the mystery of an anomaly is seen as something to be suspicious of, and a razor is to be taken to it. But in this case, every step is unexplainable. From the means by which the alleged psychic energy gets trapped on a surface, to how it remains clustered, to how it's able to generate images and sounds, etc. Et so, unless you like your theories drowning in darkness and anomalies, then it's time to, to re-examine this theory. And by the way, it's not my intention to be harsh. But when dismantling a commonly held belief, and half the world in some form or fashion believes in this, one has to be relentlessly logical. And it has always been my belief that helping folks to see the truth is an act of love and compassion. See, for many, their eternal destinies are at stake. Not because the belief itself is damnable, but because it, the residual theory, can lead to circumstances that accelerate people's damnation. Sherry Jones, she evis eviscerates the basic idea that a traumatic event is the cause behind this energy imprint. Now keep in mind, this is a woman who believes in residual energy and is well known. Jones asserts that the evidence captured is mostly that of mundane activity and not traumatic events. So based on the collection of a large body of various kinds of evidence of alleged residual energy haunts, the trauma theory does not correspond to the paranormal community's enormously extensive body of data. She readily admits it's confusing and disconcerting that the majority of the evidence is of simple, everyday, mundane activities, which should not cause an energy imprint on the environment. And I assume that she has access to um, some pretty advanced technology. And again, some may call this anomalous, anomalous, but she is saying that the majority of the evidence contradicts the trauma theory. That's not an anomaly, it's evidence against the theory. And I find her honest assessment of the data to be hugely significant. And any man or woman of integrity has to interact with their findings. It is what one would expect if the causal factor behind these events were not residual at all, but intelligent, as I am asserting. So to restate, the evidence capture is mostly a mundane activity and not traumatic. The observation is more than disconcerting. It should lead one to consider a paradigm change. All right. Um, I find her candor to be refreshing, by the way. Um, I'm going to move on because I'm going to have to speak quickly. There's, there's so many that I have here. Um, she talks about how we should not tell the homeowner that it's haunted since that might frighten them. Um, since it's allegedly non-intelligence of no danger to the client. But, you know, given her assumption, that conclusion makes sense. However, what if it is intelligent? By telling the homeowner they are no long, in, in no danger because it's merely looping energy causes them to be in more danger than before. Why? Okay, well, at least before the investigation, the clients, the homeowners, had enough healthy worry or concern to be on guard and call for help. But since the healthy fear has been erased by telling them peace, peace, when there is no peace, like false Old Testament prophets did, then they not only still have the demonic presence, but are now welcoming of it, pure evil out to destroy them. Once they were concerned and guarded, but now they are embracing the enemy of their souls. That's tragic beyond words, and it angers me. 
Telling a homeowner the truth is always the best policy, just as you would want a medical doctor not sugarcoat your diagnosis. Hell is infinitely more frightening than any initial reaction a homeowner might have. Asserting that the theory does not correspond to Occam's razor, the entire process is unexplainable. Um, without realizing Sherry Jones and telling the truth has gone a long way to undermine the foundation for residual energy, but we got, we got more to go. Number five, no mechanism exists to explain the process. Consider the following quote um, from How to Think About Weird Things. The problem is that we know of no mechanism that could record such information in the stone or play it back. Chunks of stone just do not have the same properties as reels of tape. Even magnetic tape can't record sound or video without a special recording head. Speaking to a magnetic tape will not record anything, nor can one hear what's recorded on a magnetic tape by putting it up to one's ear. In both cases, a special device like a read-write head is needed and the stone tape theory provides no clue as to what such device would be. Theodore Schick and Louis Vaughn and how to think about weird things. Yeah, I keep repeating myself, but please don't see this as yet another anomaly. It's not an anomaly. It's evidence against this theory. If this theory were true, there should be a mechanism to explain the process. That's the way real reality works. That's how natural nature works. For a process that allegedly occurs so frequently, one would assume it could be explained at some level. But this speculation's process can't be explained at all. Only analogies given, like the film recorder. On the other hand, I can explain the mechanism behind the truth, the demonic deception, very simply, as in Occam's uh, what the search should be the case. Think of what has been said by these men. There is nothing in nature that is similar to magnetic tape. Nothing in nature that is equivalent to a recording head. Nothing in nature that resembles a read-write head that would play back sound. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So for argument's sake, even if we accept the limestone theory that it can receive and print in memories similar to magnetic tape, what is there in this rock which can even remotely resemble a reed right head which projects loud cries, footsteps two floors away, or multiple solid apparitions running through the woods at Gettysburg? You know what this resembles? A miracle, self-generated by nature. Are you familiar with the technology behind building a film recorder equipment? It takes considerable skill and intelligence to accomplish that task. Think of what the technology it would take to project solid apparitions running through the woods. To my knowledge, the military, military can't even do that. What these two men did not mention was the further need of the equivalent of speakers, amplifiers, and visual project, projection mechanism capable of projecting a solid object. The read right head is just the beginning of a complex process of audio and visual special effects miraculous looking special effects. How does a rock project a solid figure that walks perfectly? Please try to visualize how a simple energized rock could produce an astonishing sound and light show that outperforms our best efforts at hologramming. Have you ever studied how holograms are created? I suggest that you look into it. Um, as we noted earlier, the solid apparitions are not attainable through current technology. It's mind-boggling in the extreme to think that rocks can project um, not only a vaporous apparition, but one that's solid. Okay, in fact, in real life, there needs to be a person to press the equivalent of the record button and a person to press the playback button. And these men have stated a devastating truth about the central paranormal theory. It lacks a mechanism. And in most cases, if a theory lacks a mechanism, it's rejected. A mechanism is simply a means of explaining how the process works. If one merely asserts that something happens, but cannot explain how this process happen, how it happens, 
then that's problematic in the extreme. Stating that residual energy acts like a tape film recorder is not an explanation. It's simply an analogy, and a faulty analogy at that. Yet folks continue to regularly use the tape analogy to explain residual energy. I'm suggesting that there is a spiritual component that is driving this faulty theory along with such force. If it is demonic driven, it is, it is demonic driven as the forces it is attempting to explain. When you consider the other anomalies we mentioned and add to them the theory lacks an explanation of how the processes works, and it's time to think it through. And this theory is far from simple, and as Jones noted, it does not explain the phenomena. And the current issue is the lack of falsifiability or verifiability of a mechanism that does not exist. I need to repeat the key, a key point. The trauma theory does not explain the phenomena. It is entirely and empirically false in that it does not conform to the observable phenomena. Okay, now remember the cumulative, na cumulative nature of my arguments from science. Take all that what Ms. Jones said out of the lack of mechanism and one is left with no scientific evidence for this theory's validity. It doesn't explain most of the phenomena and it lacks a mechanism, but we haven't finished. Number six, the entire theory rests upon another unproven assumption, that there is a new, as of yet, uncategorized kind of energy. Psychic emotional energy. Yeah, there's even some physicists who are talking about it these days, but there is, if you look on <clears throat> in the science textbooks or if you Google kinds of energy, you will find things like um, uh, chemical energy, you'll find um, electrical energy or uh, mechanical, nuclear, radiant, elastic, gravitational energy, but um, you will not find psychic or emotional energy. Um, like I said, one or two scientists are talking about it, but that's, uh, that's to be expected in our environment, which we talked about before, which is becoming so paganized. Demonic energy is usually behind this anyway. Uh, if we're talking about things like Reiki, um, it is said to be this explosive outburst of this kind of energy that gets imprinted on the environment and plays over and over again. Um, <clears throat> that there is energy is not the issue. That there are emotions is not the issue. That the uncontrolled outburst of emotion causes expenditures of energy is not the issue. What is the issue is this. Is there a category of energy known as psychic slash paranormal slash emotional energy? That's the issue. If you consult any textbook on energy, you'll find things like electrical, chemical, radiant, nuclear, mechanical, thermal, elastic, gravitational energy. However, there is no category in science as psychic energy or emotional energy. There are less examples of it, which we'll look at um, in another segment, but it's experience and not evidence interpreted in a circular fashion. It, it is not yet, anyway, an accepted category of energy in science. And even if it was, energy is supposed to act like energy. You know, what often passes for psychic emotional energies in an environment is either psychological processes, perception of body language cues, or demonic energy. Hence the very stuff that allegedly gets imprinted or replayed in the environment does not itself even exist, despite half the world speaking of it as if it did. In other words, residual energy is comprised of a substance that is non-existent. And we really should be more careful with our energy, the language. <clears throat> in addition, energy is inanim inanimate. And to attribute emotions to it is anthropomorphizing it, giving it human traits. And that's a fallacy, a logical fallacy. Anger is real, and energy is real. But angry energy, or energy filled with anger, is to speak as if inanimate object were a person. People have anger. People have joy. People have love or hate. Rocks or energy do not. 
The more I ponder this notion of rigid, rigid, rigid energy, the more unreal it becomes. Just because many people believe this kind of energy exists does not make it so. Our believing has no bearing on the ontological status of emotional psychic energy or anything else for that matter. <clears throat> there have been many wrong-headed notions that have been universally, almost universally believed in the past. Seven, if these are place memories, photos of past imprints, holographic images caught on natural surfaces, then why isn't the original scenery included? Okay, we're talking about photographs of something that happened, right? Or a film. Well, occasionally the original uh, situ situational context is caught, but most of the time it's not. If you see an image of a woman apparition walking in your living room, why isn't the original scenery included? When one takes a simple photo, the original situational scenery is included, right? If this is a photo or a film of an original image 100 years ago, then why isn't the original situational scenery surrounding the event included as well? If this process is, ad is ad advanced enough to capture and replay the person in the environment, then why can't it replay the environment the person was in? For something so incredible, why can't it even get <clears throat> the scenery right? Maybe it's not a memory or a filming at all. It's certainly not acting like a camera or a video recorder, so why use the analogy? It seems to be intentionally stripping the person of their environment and looping just the person. To me, it looks like more signs of intelligent intervention. Do you catch the force of my reasoning? Since a simple photo or video obviously catches the scenery and not just the primary subject, then why does that not occur in the process of place memory? Is it selective memory? I think what I'm trying to say is that we need just to drop that whole analogy. It just doesn't work. <clears throat> if there could be such high-tech place memories occurring in locations like Gettysburg, where alleged multiple beyond holographic images are moving through the woods, the not the original woods, but the existing woods, then why can't something as relatively simple as a soldier's original scenery part, be part of the holographic equation surrounding as well. Part of the mystery, I guess. But this is not mystery. I think it's ugliness of asymmetrical reasoning and false demonic reality. If one were to postulate demonic mimicry as I am, then explain the various mysteries is rather simple. See, we must not remember, forget the angel of light principle in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, in which Satan and his demons can appear as anything. And if they can appear as Jesus, then appearing as anything else would be easy. Okay? I remind you that we're not discussing the run of the mill.